Hello and welcome to our weekly Pasha Shira with the commentary of the Alshach Kodesh, it's Pasha's Korach, and um, as usual, dedication to the Shir. Um, to this week, Rafael Chayab and Sora, the young man we've been dabbing for, for, well, gosh, a, a long time, and Baruch Hashem, as I told you last week, he's had at Slocha and Good News, and also for somebody who I know very well, it's called Malka Rochel Bas Shina Manucha, who is going to have a surgery, and it should go with a complete and 100% success. Uh, if you would like to dedicate the shear to somebody whom you love, who may be going through some treatment, who may be having some sort of procedure, uh, who has a simcha, that's a nice procedure, uh, coming up, or to commemorate somebody who is no longer with us, then just contact me at yy at askrabbiyy.com, and we will dedicate the shear accordingly. Pasha's Karach. I remember many years ago, uh, I was um, in a certain town and there was a yeshiva in the town and there was a fight between two brothers and the yeshiva, the two sons of the previous Rosh Yeshiva. And it was a question of who was going to, as it were, take the dominant role, who was going to be the, the king of the yeshiva, as it were. And unfortunately, um, it got out of control very, very quickly. Because I was there as a guest, then people uh, were very, very keen to let me know exactly what the fight was all about. And I heard there was this um, disagreement, a conflict going on before I came, because whenever I come to speak in the community, <clears throat> and if you let me speak in your community, it's the same email address, but I always try to remember to ask the rabbi or the people who are inviting me before I arrive, is there anything going on in the community that I should be aware of, any landmines, um, that I should avoid talking about. Because very often, uh, if let's say the community is in conflict with their rabbi, vice versa, somebody might uh, ask a, what seems a completely innocuous and benign question, but really it's loaded. And in my ignorance of what the situation is, I can, as it were, seem, seem to be taking the side of one or the other. So uh, that was the situation in this particular town. I knew that there was a conflict in the yeshiva and somebody naturally wanted to tell me all about it. And I said to him with great respect, I hope you'll forgive me, but I don't want to hear uh, all about it. Uh, and forgive me for saying, I don't think you know all about it to be even able to tell me all about it. What causes a conflict might be something which you are utterly unaware of. It may have been something which had its seeds when these two brothers were six and five years of age, when one saw or perceived favoritism from their father to their sibling over them. You just don't know. So forgive me. I don't want to know about it. I don't think you know about it. And I think the less people who know about it, uh, the better. What caused the conflict between Korach and Moshe is indeed not too dissimilar, according to Rashi and the other commentators, and certainly the Alshach, uh, to that um, story I just told you. It was something that, that was rooted in the family politics, the family dynamic. When Korach felt that he should have been given a, a job, uh, a role within the family structure, uh, which gave him superiority, primacy, um, and he didn't get it, it was given to to a, a younger cousin. That was the actual rule, but that's not the, uh, the actual root of the problem, but that was not the root of the problem as he saw it, not at all. And as I mentioned in my very quick little, uh, this new series of a quick Devar Torah, three and a half minutes, but Reb Simcha Zissel, the famous Rosh Hashiva of Kelm, points out very, very astutely and very brilliantly, if you and I were involved in a conflict on any matter, and I was maybe a bit skeptical whether I was right or not. And you said to me, okay, let's have this settled by a mediator. I would probably say yes. I would not say yes, however, if the mediator was God. I mean, that's if I thought, if there was a possibility, if there's the slightest possibility, that I might be wrong, that there might be a little bit of my ego, of my anger and all the, the negative traits that are sadly are so full of, uh, in, my, in my nature, and perhaps in many people's nature, then I would not want God to arbitrate and, and mediate because he would see that. I would ask for a rabbi or a base team because human beings can make mistakes. But uh, Korach has got no hesitation whatsoever in accepting towards the end of the story, uh, Moshe's suggestion that they bring their fire pants to Hashem and let Hashem do the choosing who he wants to be the leader of the Jewish people. And that's quite astonishing. Another thing to bear in mind about Korach is that he was one of the people, one of the few four, who carried the, the Holy of Holies, the, 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 the golden box in which the two sets of 
of Luchot, of the Ten Commandments, the Broken Mums and the Whole Ones, were contained. This is utterly the, the holiest thing, the point of, uh, of connection between heaven and earth. Um, and indeed, miraculously, when they laid their hands on the, the staves that they were supposed to carry it with, it carried them and it sort of like hovered up off the ground. It just like floated along. Um, and therefore, it's pretty obvious that that sort of position was not given to any average Jew. That was given to somebody who was profoundly great. And Korach was, was profoundly great. So really, the question we have to ask ourselves is, how did this great man, with certainly a great mind, in Judaism, you don't get to be a tzaddik unless you're also somebody who has a great mind, so says the Rambam. In that case, how did he get to where he got? So here's the first important point I think I want to make. And that is, in this story, it wasn't that he had a tantrum. He didn't lose his temper, stamp his feet, have a, as I think the phrase is, a hissy fit. Uh, his attack on Moshe was something which was deeply rooted, something he might even not been consciously aware of as being based in very, very negative, very human desires like power and, and COVID and honor and all that sort of thing. Um, but when you want to turn a complaint into something that gets uh, results, you have to strategize. It wasn't the other time from started shouting. It was that he had a strategy. He had worked out a strategy how to wrest the leadership of the Jewish people from Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's really what this is all about. When I give this shir on a Shabbos afternoon, which I do in the shul, which I daven into about 40 or so men, I point, I've been pointing out the last couple of weeks, there was a certain rabbi, only met the person once, incidentally, kind of a very charming person, but he's a teeny weeny bit controversial. That's the British way of saying he's enormously controversial, but never mind. He's a teeny weeny bit controversial. And in one of his essays, he once accused Moshe Rabbein of, of, of failure and of, of making every single mistake and, and, and failing completely in every aspect of man management and human management um, of his dealings with the Jewish people. In the last few weeks, in my Sheer and Shul, I have been demonstrating, which I hope to demonstrate to you now, um, and we have actually, if you look back the last couple of weeks, talked about that too, um, that his leadership in actual fact was quite the opposite. It was quite brilliant. He was a brilliant manage, man, man, manager, but that doesn't mean to say that you can be the most brilliant man manager in the world, or person manager, for those who prefer that word. Uh, and yet, if the person doesn't want to pay attention, no matter how much you offer them, how much compromise you offer them, uh, you're very unlikely to get uh, the results that you hope for. However, having said all that, uh, let's have uh, a little uh, look at the Parsha. Remind ourselves just at the beginning of the story. Now, the Alja here is very long and it's all brilliant. It's all a brilliant, uh, I've called this sheer construction and countering, countering a perfect conflict. That's constructing and countering a perfect conflict. The strategy, his construction of his attack in Moshe Rabbeinu was perfectly constructed. Moshe's countering of it was a perfect lesson in how to defuse a bomb that somebody has set. And I, I don't, we don't have time in, in, in the short amount of time that we have, and I'm, I'm still, maybe if anybody could let me know, I'd be very interested in this. Sometimes I make the share 40 minutes, sometimes if I'm uh, swept up in the passion of the al I think it goes to 50 minutes, and sometimes it's 35. Um, and we all know that uh, people's attention spans, including mine, by the way, uh, have, have diminished over the last uh, uh, decades or so, two decades or so. So it's, uh, it's a question of which format is most preferable to my watchers and listeners. I'd be very, very appreciative if you could give me a little message, maybe on the, on the YouTube channel, or if you could email me at that address, um, or if you see me on Facebook, just to let me know, do you like the, 30, the 35 minutes? or the slightly longer 40 minute, or the uh, 40, 45, or even longer than that. But I, I doubt that, but I'd be very interested in hearing what you have to say. Let's go straight across to uh, the stone chumash of uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Artscroll. And before I go on, let me just end up that tiny little thought that we started with. Yes, Moshe Korak was great, one of the greatest of all time. But I once heard from the from the holy Manchester Rosh Hashiva, who I had the enormous privilege of being close to, and the Manchester Rosh Hashiva, Rav Siegel, who truly was a holy man, and, and everybody who is um, alert to the signs will, will be able to attest to that fact. 
uh, I once heard him speaking, at, I think it was the last bar mitzvah, or the, the bar mitzvah of his last grandson to reach bar mitzvah. I think that, that's the right way to put it. And he pointed out that when you put on tefillin for the first time, and of course you have to have the purest thoughts when you're wearing tefillin, um, but the parshias, the little uh, parchments inside the box of the shell rosh, the one on the head and the one on the arm, the parshias are um, uh, wound round by the hair. It's a hair um, from uh, taken from a from a cow, so a cow's tail, if I remember rightly, and they use that as the as a string to tie it together. The question is, why did it, why is that halakhically, why is it halakhically uh, that the, the vehicle, the, the material that's chosen? And the answer is, because when you're wearing these holy tefillin, and you are, your ambition is to internally reflect what you're wearing on your head to be in the highest spiritual level, then it's critically important uh, to bear in mind the, the lesson hinted at by the, the, the hair from the cow, from the cow's tail. Um, because uh, it was and the Jewish people were at the holiest level, the highest level, we made the eagle as of the golden calf. Um, so it's very, very easy, uh, surprisingly easy, for a person even at the highest level to slip down. And it says in Pirke Ovis, of course, never be sure of yourself to the day that you die, you, of your death. And indeed, uh, in the moment before you die, you just never know. So here we get somebody who's great, who has a great mind, who in, indeed is a very holy man, who um, slips up badly. There is obviously, I don't want to be preachy, um, maybe I've talked to myself, because after all, I'm watching myself uh, giving the share, um, reflected back at me in the, in the uh, computer screen. And there's a lesson for all of us. You're never quite as, as invincible as you think you are. Be careful when it comes to your, your, your uh, job as, as being a Jew. Okay. So Korach, and it tells you his lineage, and Dosan Aviram, of course, Dosan Aviram are the perennial pests, and they, all the great uh, uh, challenges and fights um, against Moshe Rabbeinu till now, they were part of it. Dosan Aviram, B'nai Eliyab, the sons of Eliyab, the Oin Ben Pelas, and somebody called Oin Ben Pelas, B'nai Reuven, who were all sons of Reuven, the Reuvenites, from the tribe of Reuben, in other words, but they come and lift their Moshe, and they stand up before Moshe. But Anoshim be Bnei Yisrael, and included Reuben Anoshim from Bnei Yisrael, Chamishim Amasayim Nesei Ada, two hundred and fifty princes or judges even of of the congregation, um, and it says Korei Emoed Anshishem, men of great renown, great fame, also very very great people. They call on Al Moshe and they stand and confront confront the Moshe, um, the Alon and Aaron. The Yamro Alehem Nisetam Rablochem, you've taken far too much to yourselves. He call her either Kulam Kadashim. The entire Jewish people are all holy. And this is a point the Alshik is going to uh, make clear. It's part of the strategy of the construction of his his challenge and his conflict. This Machlokus was crafted crafted to produce the results that he wanted. And of course, you're not going to stand up and say, you know, I want the job. What you're going to say is, it's unfair to the other people. You miss yourself out, naturally. Um, and the interesting thing is, he's right. The whole people were holy. The Jewish people were holy. When Hashem says, make for me a mishkan, make for me a dwelling place, and I will, I will dwell, and I'll dwell in them. Not I'll dwell in it. I'll dwell in them. He would literally be able to dwell within the Jewish people. Each one was would be a little Beit Um, And of course, the whole purpose of the Beit HaMikdash is to, as it were, be the point of contact and communication between heaven and earth. Well, uh, before we made the Eglis of, that would be unnecessary. God could speak directly to each and every one of us. And of course, the Jewish people all reached the level of prophets and prophetesses. So this is the point he is, the industry is a baton, and he is um, he's emphasizing. Uh, they're all holy. <laughs> Not fighting, not, not fighting with me. Um, you call Aida Kalam Kadashim with Saikam Hashem, and Hashem dwells amongst them, as Hashem said he would. Uh, so, why have you elevated yourself, promoted yourself to being the king uh, above the Jewish people? Okay, now Rashi goes on to say that there was a lot more going on here, and there was chutzpah. And they challenged famous Rashi, they challenged himself and say, 
that if you've got a room full of sorim, as you can see behind me, um, full of words of Torah, do you need a mezuzah in the door? <clears throat> if one mezuzah, um, and the words, I can't remember how many words there are inside a mezuzah, um, those words can, as it were, uh, relieve a, 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 a room of its, of its uh, halakhic requirements. What have you got all these books full of Torah words? So who needs a mezuzah? And what about garments all blue? If one blue thread on the tzitzis, you fulfill the, the, uh, your obligation, surely if the garment's completely blue, you don't need it, huh? And it was with chutzpah, it was with aggression, and it was, it was belittling. Now that's going to be very, very important, uh, because when you construct a conflict, and when you want to recruit people to your side, who doesn't? Just think of the last time you wanted, you were against somebody. Don't you want to tell your version of the story to other people? And it's not, as it were, a strategy. It's not a, it's not a, you know, you're not constructing it in order to gain allies. You just, we all naturally want people to say, oh, you're right. But here it is a natural fact to get, to get allies. So here it's a challenge, but it's a challenge with chutzpah. Hold that thought, because we're going to come back to that in a moment. For Yishmael Moshe, the Yippel upon it, and Moshe hears and he falls on his face. And he says to Karach, and he says to his congregation, and the morning will, Hashem will let us know, Asher Loi, the one who is, that he wants, but as a Kodesh, and the one who is holy, the Hikar of Love, is Asher Yifkar Boy Yakar Belov. And he will draw him near to him, and that will be the one that he's chosen. But that's all we'll have time to go for. Into, there's a lot more, obviously, before the, uh, the, the culmination, the dramatic conclusion of this story but that's enough i think for us to get uh, a little glimpse into the alchus analysis of what's going on here uh, and a glimpse of the genius of the alchus so basically the first thing the alchus wants to, to tell us here is that there, this this technique is something which repeats itself many many times in history and certainly in jewish history and why that screen is going blur, I do not know. So I'm on this camera. Whenever I move, it goes blur. So anybody out there who is expert in this stuff and say, ah, Rabbi, if you do this, that, and the other, I think it's something to do with the light. But, never mind. Um, but back to this. Many, many times in history that somebody does something in this way, exactly in this way. Um, allow me to leave Judaism for a second and go to Roman history um, or Shakespeare. When, when Julius Caesar crosses the Rubicon, the Rukon, of course, the river, uh, not too far from Rome, which no Roman army was allowed to cross. Because that, it was an act of outright rebellion and revolution against the Senate and uh, the people of Rome. And Julius Caesar, historically, and of course in the play, crosses the Rubicon. It's critical, as we'll see in a second, if you want to make a challenge, to challenge somebody's authority, and you need allies, you've got to let them see that you're not going to back out. You have to demonstrate you're willing, and you are, and you have crossed the Rubicon. So let me read to you what the Alshak says here, and I think this will give us a very interesting insight. So strategy number one, in order to get allies, you have to show them that it's not about you. We are the good guys. We, I'm a new, like all politicians, I'm not going to Congress for myself or in any way to get money for myself. No, I want money for the people. Yeah, everybody wants money for the people. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, he says something very interesting. Korach took who? Dosen and Aviram and On. They've already signed up. They're already part. They're in his team already. So there's no doubt whatsoever they're going to back him up. But four is not going to be much of a challenge to Moshe Rabbeinu. He needs many, many more. He needs a general perception that they've got a point. So he needs allies. What does he do? In order to show the allies that he's serious about this and they're not going to be left holding the baby or whatever the phrase is, um, he has to show them that he's crossed the Rubicon. So let's, let's see how this works. Then, then he performs exactly what Achitofel, this is, you'll find him Malachim Aleph, Tezayin and Kof Aleph. Um, this is exactly Achitofel's advice to Avshalom. Avshalom, Dovid Amal's son who wanted to challenge him for the kingship, wanted to take the kingship for himself. And Achitofel said to him, um, you know what? If you want this to work, you're going to need allies. You want to need, if, you want, if you want to get allies, you're going to have to make sure that they know that you're serious about this and you're not going to back out. That there's not going to be any reconciliation between you and your father, in which case 
father and son are reconciled and he the son the wayward son is forgiven but the guys who allied themselves to the wayward son well you can't particularly anticipate a father's uh, um, love extending that far and they will be decapitated you've got to show that that's not going to happen so what did he say that Akitofel said to um, uh, said to Avshanam the Jewish people are not going to join with you in your fight against your father unless they know that you're in all the way. Uh, because they're going to say, tomorrow or next day, they're going to be reconciled and we're going to be in trouble. Okay, says, I'll give you a way of demonstrating to them that it can't happen and they've got nothing to worry about. Go to one of his concubines and rape her in a public place on a roof that people can see it it can be witnessed so it's not it's not somebody sneaked in you know as a young man and lost control of his mind and his passions no this was a a, a public demonstration that you know uh, the worst insult to his father that would never and could never be forgiven Okay, go to your father's palegish, his concubine, in a place that will be seat on a, on a roof that would be viewed from other rooftops. But as the Israel, he he's done something, he's, he's insulted his father in public to the nth degree. There can be no reconciliation, no turning back from this. He's crossed the Rubicon. Do the exact same thing. Therefore, when Korach comes with his three allies, of course, Onmen Pelis' wife doesn't let him join in, but he's got he's got Dawson Bamir. When he comes with his two allies and challenges, it says there, and we look at the Posak, Mayika Korach, Men Yisab, and Kos, Men Levi, Ben Dawson Aviram, and Dawson Aviram, and Onmen Pelis, Ben Eruven, for Yakumon if Nei Moshe, and they stand up in front of Moshe, but Anoshim Ben Yisrael, and there are people there watching what's going on. They have not committed to this fight yet. Because the fight in their eyes, as we'll see in a second, seems maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. Maybe Moshe has taken too much from himself. Oh, if you can't be sure of yourself to the day of your death, and that applies to Korach, and it applies to you, and it applies to me, and it applies to Moshe as well. Maybe he has overstepped. Maybe he's taken too much from himself, and maybe they've got a point. But we don't want to get involved in this, and we're going to be exposed, and we're going to be left holding the baby, or holding the holding the machlokas, and therefore it has to be that they come and demonstrate their op- opposition to, uh, to to Moshe in a way which is unforgivable, the exact same way that Avshalom's uh, opposition and uh, insult to the to his father is the exact same, unrecoverable from. Okay, as another key loy and so it will see, reading the Alshak now, and so it will see Alshak that they will never be recovered. There is no way of getting. Um, uh, of of, of uh, getting out of that one. Therefore, you've now got the people to commit. So stage one, tell them that it's 100% L'Shem Shemaim. It's 100% for the sake of the people. It's nothing to do with you. And maybe you think it is nothing to do with you. But if you can get, if you can convince them of that agenda, then you've got allies. Then that's that's going to work for you. Because then they'll join in. Okay. Um, good. The noth- next thing is to re- re-emphasize, says the al the fact that I'm not doing it for myself. So he does that. So when the 250 uh, people sitting on the fence and the Jewish people see that, mm, then they, they join in. They see two, one of two things. One, uh, in case they would turn around and say, what are you involved in this fight for? What's it got to do with you? Uh, be yourself, who can godl. Uh, you think he's going to give you all sorts of financial benefits and rewards when he's the con godl? He makes himself the con godl. Con godl don't have any rewards to give. Shenis kibaroyz kola ida shikamam al moshev alaren. When they see that the whole uh, that Karach and his 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 small gang uh, fight against Moshe and Aaron, halo kulam or rubam yarmo liergam oisam bavoni, then naturally they will turn around and want to kill them for this. Or if that could, they could easily do so. Why? But on them, he had called to meet up because every single Jew is a Talmud of Moshe Rabbeinu. And the Gemara famously says that there's three people who can't insult a man's wife, a man's place where he comes from, and uh, and also a man's Rebbe. 
So now here's Korach insulting the Rebbe of the whole of Klal Yisrael. Omi Godel, my Moshe, my Yisrael. He was as great as Moshe. So this has to be, you know, suicidal, no? Um, Indeed, a challenge to Moshe is a challenge to God. In order to make sure that those concerns will not concern the would-be or possible allies, to regard in the first one, he says, Rav Lachem. And he says, you know what? You've taken on too much. Don't let you think that this fight is because of me and what I want, as we said before. No, it's Rav Lachem. You've taken too much from the Jewish people. Al Kami. Shahu Reev Lolona, the fight's nothing to do with us. Because you've taken too much away from the people who are all holy, which is what we'd said before. But the second point, he's wise enough to flatter and to lie to the whole of the Jewish people. If indeed it's true that Moshe and Aaron are holy, but so are you. Gam king kol la'eda. But Shani's, and another point, ki al Moshe nakalim al Moshe of Aaron, lo hanagia el atzma. But I want, but we want to emphasize, it's nothing to do with us. No, no, no. Ki em dover kvod Hashem, al kob Yisrael, bona bekoira him chamish, him, him koshim. It's because we are worried about the honor of the Jewish people. Okay, fine. That will do as an, an, an introduction. So it's strategized. It's considered. It's planned. And it's hard to say that it's a hissy fit and it's a stamping of feet. And it's a tantrum. And he just burst out, you know, his challenge to my Rabbeinu. This They'd sat down and planned out exactly how they're going to make this work. Now, as I said before, uh, when it comes to a fight, um, uh, I didn't want to get involved in that one. But there's another uh, uh, yeshiva I know of. And I actually know the Rosh Hashima. And a, it was another, a, 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 no connection, but another yeshiva. The Rosh Yeshiva of the other yeshiva, when this new yeshiva had started, a lot of his Talmudim were upset. There was a second yeshiva grow, a starting in town. I should point out uh, that there is always, um, two was all, at Ramat Asyal Solomon, when he came to Manchester uh, to celebrate the, uh, the laying the foundation of a, of a yeshiva called Chari Tara. My late brother-in-law, uh, Ronnie Sharon, incidentally, was the man who gave the money for the building of, uh, originally for the building of Shari Tower. Uh, when, he, when he came there, Ramat Asyal, who was the Mashgiach of Gates of Yeshiva in those days, pointed out there was always a Yavna in the Pumpadisa. Um, there was always two um, uh, yeshivas, um, in, whether in Bovel, whether in Nets Israel. Uh, there's no, it's, it's, it's not a, a contradiction to, to, to Kovat Torah, to two yeshivas, quite the opposite. In other words, he was embracing and well, welcoming this new yeshiva, which was going to grow up to be, as it were, the number two to Gateshead, the, the great yeshiva of Europe after the war, um, the one I was very, very blessed to be a Talmud of. Um, and, and there's no conflict here, but it could seem to be a conflict. So when some people were annoyed um, at the, the founding of Shari Tara, uh, a second yeshiva, then when they asked the Rosh Shiva, it was called Rabbi Rebbe, not fly, he simply said, don't reply. Don't reply. And I thought at the time that was very, very wise. I mean, I was a younger man, so therefore, and uh, my natural uh, reaction would be to reply and to argue, but sometimes not arguing is the right thing to do. I remember recently, Hamadiyah sent me a letter uh, that somebody had written attacking one of my articles in Hamadiyah and asked if I wanted to reply. I learned the lesson well, um, from Reb Gavriel, but I'd seen it first in the al Because Moshe's reply to this is no reply. It's very, very hard to fight against, or to cause a fight if somebody's not fighting back. This is clever. As there is a strategy, as there is um, uh, the famous book, what's it called? Something about war, famous Chinese strategist from 3,000 years ago. Oh, it's gone out of my mind. Um, anyway, basically, the way of war, something like that, I don't know. Uh, but the strategies of war are way, way, way established and known in human history going back. And one of the great tactics of war is simply not to fight back. It's very, very hard when, you know, a huge army has presented itself. Think of a medieval army and the battlefield probably takes about two hours to get, you know, just to get them in, arranged and just nobody on the other side. What do you do? Uh, so Moshe doesn't fight back. He certainly doesn't fight back then, but there's, he, he's, he's not, he, Moshe Rabbeinu is, 
can certainly uh, uh, fight back if it needs be. So let me read to you uh, what the Alsha says here. So the Jewish people don't challenge Korach and his, his group for the challenge to Moshe because they've declared, and it seems to be a, a, a good argument, a reasonable argument, that uh, they're doing it for the sake of Hashem. Maybe they have taken on two more. Incidentally, I should point, point out, when Moshe Rabbeinu uh, says to them, as he does shortly, this is something he is challenged for. From the Torah does criticize him for this. He says to them, Rav Lachem, B'nai Levi, you've taken on too much for yourself. When he wanted to get to Eretz Yisrael, then um, Hashem says to him, Rav Loch, you've got enough. Don't want more. And the, uh, the, uh, the rabbis explain, it was a hint that in telling them, no, they were wrong, and he was right to challenge to fight back. But it was the way he said it. He said, Rav Lachem, you've taken on too much. A Jew should always want to do more. A Jew should also always want to do more. The way that Karach wanted to do it, the motives why Karach wanted to do it, that was certainly wrong. But by expressing in words which were ambiguous and could lead somebody to say, oh, Moshe said you should not, you, you, you've done enough, that's enough. No, Moshe doesn't think it's enough. It's enough if it's going to be used badly. But for a Jew to want to do more, so there's a level at his level, uh, there is a level at Moshe's Madriga, spiritual level, um, of uh, a criticism of his, his choice of words. Uh, but how does he react to this? So, so the Jewish people do not say, you've challenged our Moshe Rabbeinu, our great teacher, boom, and beat them to death. No, because their argument, which they have now deployed, the strategy is to show that we're doing this for God. Well, what can Moshe say back? If they think, if the Jewish people are now unsure and think that perhaps they are being, um, they're being sincere in their challenge to Moshe Rabbeinu, then for Moshe Rabbeinu to fight back could backfire. And I've seen that so many, many times. Uh, if you in any way, especially as a rabbi, um, express um, a side, even if it's the right thing to do, then people just don't see that as the right thing, even if it is the right thing. So he keeps quiet. So therefore it says, uh, So what, so it's best to just to listen. Better just the key. Because they don't know. He knows what's going on. He sees through their, their insincerity, but the people might not. <coughs> if the people are unsure, then to make a case when the audience, when the jury is not convinced, is a bad, you know, to, to, to appeal to the jury to bring in a non, a, a guilty or not guilty verdict before you've made your case, before the jury are convinced, is a mistake. Moshe is, realizes at this stage they're not convinced, so therefore I won't make my final appeal. He keeps quiet. Balkane law on us, so Moshe doesn't reply to this. So let's see that inside. That's. Interesting to look at. Bika Korach and Yitzhar, as we said before, and they come, but you come and live Moshe and Anoshim in Israel. They call Al Moshe and Al Aaron, and they say to him, Rav Lachem, you've taken too much. Kikolei, the Kolam Kadoshim, Psachim Hashem, Madu Atinas Al Kalchem, why do you challenge? Why do you take too much from the first Hashem? But Yeshua Moshe, we pill upon him. And Moshe listens. What did he say when he listened? Nothing. He didn't reply. But he fell on his face. Now, this is interesting. The, the, cha the, the, the challenge of the claim of Korach and his party is that Moshe has elevated him to the position of, himself to the position of kingship, um, taking, you know, uh, all the reins of power for himself. Um, his reaction doesn't quite show that. He doesn't say it's not true, because then it's an argument and he says, she says. But rather, what does he do? He falls on his face, falls in the ground. That's hardly the position you would expect somebody like Pharaoh to do, to demonstrate um, uh, his kingship. People fall on the ground to him. A king to fall on the ground? A humble man falls on the ground. Caligula, uh, one of Rome's most uh, corrupt and evil kings. Uh, you can't see him falling on the ground. Uh, Peter the Great isn't falling on the ground. Um, but Moshe falls on the ground. It's, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. In that action, there is a subconscious message, subliminal message being passed to the Jewish people 
against the argument that he is a megalomaniac who's stolen uh, the throne for himself uh, and, the, and the reins of power. Then he says, tomorrow, we'll, 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 we'll work on this tomorrow. Of Alan Gale, Aaron. Oh, he talks about Aaron. I'm going to miss that bit out. But then he says, tomorrow we're going to let Hashem ju uh, judge this. Let Hashem mediate. Now, this is, again, genius. The genius is to say that I know that nobody's, if I'm making myself, I'm coming down to your level. Two people climb, climb into the boxing ring, they're two boxers. Um, if I don't climb into the boxing ring, so let it be settled. Let's not be settled with fisticuffs. Let it be settled by Hashem himself. Then that completely diffuses this bomb that's been set by Korach. Let Hashem judge. judge. It's not me. And what's Korach going to say? As I said before, to say, don't let Hashem judge, is to expose yourself to the, the supposition that maybe you're wrong, or maybe you think you're wrong. Yes, let Hashem judge. And of course, he does think he's right. So he does let Hashem do the judging. Even then, as we see later on, it comes out that Korach tries very, very hard, uh, sorry, Moshe tries very, very hard to diffuse this and, and, and make sure that it doesn't have to get to that stage. But they don't listen and they go with the fire pans and Hashem makes it quite clear who's, you know, who's right and who's wrong in this particular case. I'm still intrigued with the idea of the great man falling. And funnily enough, uh, this morning, uh, I have a chabrusa, uh, several chabrusas, but one of my chabrusas is somebody called Rabbi Yitzchak Young, a very old friend of mine. And we've been learning together for about five years in the mornings at Shiva uh, before we got on with our busy days. And uh, here it's, there's a, it's, the, it's the last posuk, if I remember, uh, uh, the last two pasukim really, of the fourth pa uh, paragraph of Mishli, Proverbs, the commentary of the Vilna Gon. And he says something tremendously interesting. I think you, you might, I hadn't planned to put this into the share, but it's so exciting. I can't resist uh, uh, telling you this. And the the POSIC says the following thing. Um, this is a POSIC, uh, again, Dalit and, and, and it's Kof, Kof Vov. Palace, balance or measure, Magli Raglecha, the steps that you take, but Kodor Hecho Yichaino, and make all your, your, your path in life. Firmly, firmly fixed. That would be a rough translation. Let me read to you what the Vilna Gaon has to say. Shnei and Yoni Mida say, there are two types of, uh, of Midas, of character traits. Midas Shalonda Imoy Bishbateva, there's the character traits that you are born with, it's your nature. And the other, Shiragal is Atsmoy, the other ones that you, you, um, you grow to become your second nature. You choose, you work on. So the words, and if you look at that possible, you got hold of a, a Mishri, palace magel, raglecha, it, it's a verb. Palace means to balance these two. So I'll tell you the whole thing outside and not read it to you because we're moving on a little bit time-wise. But he says the following thing. So, as I said, we're all born with certain character traits. The Vilna Gaon previously says that the whole purpose of being here is in order to uh, create, to gain a character trait that you've not got till now. And if you don't do that, what was the point in you being here? Very strong language, just a few seconds before in the fourth Peric in, in Mishli. However, back to this, he says an astonishing thing. We're all born with certain character traits or natural strengths. Then there are the ones that you work on. And those ones that you work on are become your second nature becomes a second nature. And if you tend to that second nature, and he tells you how to do that slowly, stage by stage by stage, weaning yourself away from negative influences until that becomes a positive, so you can join the, your new positive character trait to your old one, and then others and others and others, and that becomes your great achievement in life. You became, you're an angry person, no longer an angry person, you're a jealous person, no longer a jealous person. But you have to tend to that because you can easily slip up. And if you easily slip up, he says, and here I close the safer, but he says roughly, uh, be very careful. Never make the mistake of assuming because you have achieved a great amount in your life and you've grown and added new character traits and after, one after the other until it becomes your second nature, then it's okay. I'm now immune. I have, uh, I'm inoculated against all those negative things that are out there in the world. I can expose myself and I won't be affected. You will. Even the greatest person who has accumulated an enormous amount of character traits, positive character traits, can still lose them 
And that was the message that Manchester of Sheba gave to his grandson. Why we tie the Parshas and the, and the Tefillin? Well, the hair taken from the tail of a cow to remind us of the golden calf. That when the Jewish people, or when a Jewish person reaches the greatest heights, he can still come tumbling down, as did Korach. I wish you all a very, very great Shabbos.